Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. I'm going to begin this morning by making an assumption that all parents of teenagers have the same universal struggle of making sure they're up and moving in the mornings. I remember when our boys were at home, oftentimes we would find them still asleep with their alarm blaring across the room. And while Trista was and is still a long-suffering woman, our ideas of waking up the boys were often quite different. She would simply walk in, turn on the lights, and say, boys, it's time to get up, only to go back five minutes later to sit on the edge of their beds and to talk to them until they finally got up. I chose a completely different means and route. I would simply just walk into the room, turn on the lights, and say, Alexa, play Copacabana. Or, Alexa, play the Macarena. Or, Alexa, play anything from Cher. It was amazing how quickly these teenagers would jump up out of bed. It's the musical equivalent of a glass of cold water to the face. In my mind, that's the opening of Mark's gospel, because... After 400 years of silence, Mark begins his gospel account by introducing us to John the Baptist, who was like a whole bucket of ice water to the face. John comes onto the scene and he wakes the Jewish world out of their slumber. They had been anticipating the coming of a Messiah, but they would have never dreamed that it would have been announced this way. They're awaiting a political power, but what God gives them is a prophet telling them to repent. Today, what I want us to do in our time together is take a very quick scene-by-scene survey of the first two chapters of Mark's Gospel. There are going to be 11 scenes, and we'll spend an average of maybe 30 to 45 seconds on each scene. But we're going to end up by making three observations about what Jesus' ministry means to us. And it's an awful lot of ground to cover, so let's get started at the beginning. The very first scene is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. We start with one of the strangest characters in the entire Bible, a man by the name of John the Baptist. Now, anybody who knew me as a teenager would tell you I used to wear a lot of weird and strange clothes, but I never went full camel's hair. I imagine that John probably looked an awful lot like a a biker whose diet consisted of locusts and wild honey. Now, Mark mentions his clothes and his diet because they were, well, weird. But... I think oftentimes we're not shocked by it because we've heard this story for so long. Mark wants us to know, though, that John is on the eccentric side. John is a prophet who spends his ministry calling people to prepare for the coming Messiah. His message is very short and pointed. Stop sinning, find forgiveness through the act of baptism. Apparently, it's a message that the people were ready to hear That's why we read in verse 5 that all of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went to him as they confessed their sins. He baptized them by the Jordan River. We we quickly move to scene 2 found in Mark 1, 9-13, and it begins with Jesus arriving at that Jordan River to be baptized. A voice from heaven ascends and affirms his decision, You are my son whom I love. I am well pleased with you. And immediately the Spirit of God will drive Jesus out into the desert where he can be tempted for 40 days by the devil. I love the fact that while all the people are being baptized, Jesus needs to identify with them by submitting to baptism. He's claiming that he's one of us. And in that moment, God also identifies with Jesus by affirming his decision. It's almost like God saying, you belong to me. And then maybe to show that Jesus is really very much like us, he goes out for this intense time of temptation. Now, we'll come back to that next week, but for right now, I just want us to recognize this is, this is Mark's uh, way of showing us that Jesus is the ultimate servant. Scene 3 takes place in Mark 1, 14 through 20. Scene 3 begins unpleasantly, after John is put into prison, and Mark doesn't even tell us why until chapter 6. If this is your first time to read the Gospel of Mark, you might be wondering, well, if John, who is the warm-up act, gets thrown into prison, what's going to happen to Jesus? Jesus is not afraid, though. He says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And at that moment, Jesus begins to assemble a team. He called some fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and he tells them, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
When we get to scene 4 in uh, verses 21 through 28 of Mark 1, we see that Jesus is entering into a synagogue. And for those of us that have gotten this goofy notion that Jesus wasn't a churchgoer, maybe we need to pay more attention to Mark chapter 1 or Mark chapter 3 or Mark chapter 5. Jesus seems to always be going to churches. He seems to be a lot more open to churches than they were to him. But whenever Jesus goes to a church, strange things happen. And this time's no exception. He's teaching, the people are listening, and all of a sudden, a man with an evil spirit stands up and begins to shout out. I'm pretty sure this guy with the evil spirit's not screaming about the order of worship. He's trying to identify Christ. And Jesus says, be quiet, come out of him. The evil spirit shakes the man violently and comes out of him with a shriek. Mark is beginning this narrative. It's a story and a narrative that he's going to return to quite often in his gospel, and that's that people find hope and blessing when they meet Jesus. We get to scene 5, found in Mark 1, 29-34, and people are beginning to figure out that Jesus has some answers for their questions. He has some power for their weaknesses. He has the ability to heal their sickness. And so... Everybody in town gathers at the door of the house where Jesus is staying, and he, and he helps them all night long, and he's talking with them and teaching them. And the people have to know there's something wonderful, there's something different about Jesus, even though they're not really sure who he is. Maybe that's why Jesus refuses to allow the demons to speak, because they know who he is. We get to Mark 1, 35-39, and we get to scene 6 and discover that Jesus has a source for his power. We read in verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a solitary place where he prayed. I wonder if there are times we get a little too impressed with our creativity and our programs in churches. I, I wonder if churches, if we begin to imagine that if we can do it just right, then we can make a real difference in the world. We have the audacity to entertain this idea that if we practice our faith in the correct manner, if we teach it just right, if we plan ever so carefully, then we can make a major dent in Satan's stronghold in our community. On the very heels of a successful opening day of ministry, Jesus goes off by himself to be in a solitary place to spend some time in prayer to talk to God. I think he did that for three reasons. He needed to stay connected to the power, uh, the source of power. He needed to stay focused on his mission. And he needed to maintain a relationship with his Father. Those are the same three reasons that we have to be immersed in prayer. Actually, if you take the time to read through the Gospels and the book of Acts, you'll discover, and you might be surprised, how prayer is always the first step to amazing things happening. People prayed, God worked. Scene 7 is found in Mark 1, 40 and 45, and Mark ends this chapter by showing us the true character of Jesus. Mark says that Jesus runs into a man who has leprosy. And instead of revulsion or arrogance, Jesus is filled with compassion. The leper is certain that Jesus has the power to heal him, but tell me if this sounds familiar. The leper wonders if Jesus actually cares about him. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus replies, I'm willing, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy is gone and the man is reconnected to his family, to his friends, to his church, to his entire community. You see, Jesus didn't just come to say that we need to be reconciled with God and one another. Jesus makes reconciliation a possibility. Chapter 2 begins with the eighth scene, and Jesus is preaching to a packed house, and healing people has taken an awful lot of his time. But he reminds us that his mission, his main mission, is to bridge the gap between God and people by telling them the good news. In the middle of Jesus' second point, the The ceiling tiles above him are lifted away, and a man on a stretcher is lowered right in front of him. His four friends couldn't get him to the door, so they make this rooftop ascent. Jesus seems to be impressed, and I can't imagine but him beginning to smile a little bit as he looks up and he sees those four faces looking down at him. 
hoping that he would do something for their friend. So Jesus turns to the paralyzed man on the stretcher and says, your sins are forgiven. And for the first time in Mark's gospel, somebody criticizes Jesus. The religious leaders who are watching begin to mutter, who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knows their thoughts, and he turns to them and he says, why do you have these questions in your mind? The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, but how can I prove this to you? Maybe you're thinking it's easy for me to say to the crippled man, your sins are forgiven. There's really no proof that that actually happened. But what if I say to the man, stand up, take your mat and walk? Then you'll be able to see if I really have this power or not. So Jesus said to the man, stand up, take your mat and go home. I'm pretty sure that there were people in that room who immediately thought Jesus was being cruel because this guy can't move a muscle. He's paralyzed. And then his toes begin to twitch and begin to move his feet and bend his knees. Then he sat up. In my mind, this man probably danced and jumped all the way home. That brings us to scene 9, found in Mark 2, 13-17. Jesus is beside the Sea of Galilee again when he sees something that nobody else has ever seen before. He sees the potential in a man named Levi. To everybody else, Levi is nothing more than a tax collector, a traitor. Maybe if we switched the scene from 1st century Palestine to 21st century Iraq, we would probably see Levi held up in a cave somewhere airing on Al Jazeera television. He's a wanted man. He was. Jesus wanted him. Jesus recruited him to be one of his disciples. And the very first thing Levi does is throw a party. And he invites all of his friends who are also sinners. But he wanted them to meet Jesus. Talk about causing a commotion among the religious elite. First, the whole forgiveness of sin things, and now this. The religious leaders are getting really uncomfortable with Jesus. This is not the Jesus they were expecting. So, In their uncomfort, they consider with their criticism, they begin to ask things like, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And while it seems that the religious elite was confused about who Jesus was and what he had come to do, Jesus doesn't share their confusion. He's resolute with his mission to fulfill the will of his Father, which brings us to scene 10 in Mark 2, 18-22. Not only is Jesus ignoring the neighborhood covenant, he's running right by the established religion or traditions. The really religious folks are fasting, and they notice that Jesus and his disciples are celebrating with sinners. So they continue to complain. John's followers fast, the followers of the Pharisees fast, but your followers don't fast. We demand you tell us why that's the case. Why are you not fasting? And in a very Jesus type of response, he teaches through some parables about a wedding, a patch, and wineskins. His whole point is that God is doing something new. The old ways of relating to people and to God have reached the end of their usefulness. Now is the time to get ready and to be a part of what God's about to do. God's trying to get our attention so that he can have us focus on the only thing that really matters. But like the religious leaders of old, we'd rather have the old comfortable way because we know it and we can control it. They didn't realize that God's mission and personal comfort can't exist in the same place. Which brings us to our final scene, the 11th scene from Mark 2, 23 through 28. Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field of grain on the Sabbath day. It's hot and they're hungry. And some of the disciples strip off a couple heads of grain and rub it between their hands and eat the kernels. The Pharisees, who are at this time and for the rest of his life always watching, well, they're appalled. How dare the disciples do any type of work on the Sabbath? Because as weird as it sounds for us, the Pharisees thought that the disciples were out there harvesting and threshing grain, two acts expressly forbidden on the Sabbath and punishable by death. Jesus clears up their confusion by going back to the text. You have read, which is actually a great line, because of course they read. They're the religious elite. They know everything, or so they think. 
Jesus says, you have read what David did when he and the people with him were hungry and needed food. Instead of bowing down to their traditions that are a heavy burden on the people, Jesus points them back to Scripture. He reminds them of what David did, what David and his men did when they were hungry, how they put human need above religious practices. Jesus actually puts them in a corner by invoking a story about King David. He ends by reminding them that we're not made to serve the rules. The rules were made to serve us. Now, that's just the first two chapters, but I really hope you're beginning to get the point. As you continue to read through the Gospel of Mark, you can't help but notice that Jesus continues to irritate and to annoy the religious establishment as he serves the people that he came to save. I understand Jesus is not the Messiah they were looking for. He was the Messiah that they deeply needed. So let's build a few ideas on the foundation about how Jesus related to people. First, I need you to understand that Jesus went around doing good. Did you notice how many different locations Mark tells us about? Jesus spends time in the wilderness and the city. He preaches in private homes and in public synagogues. He meets people on busy streets and on rural roads. He spoke with people along the seashore and in the fields. Jesus got around. One of the things that I I want you to notice about Jesus' ministry and the ministry that you're called to is that it has to happen outside the building. Last week we talked about the call to worship with our lives, and I mentioned since we have these beautiful and wonderful buildings, we, it's easy to get lulled into this thought that worship only happens here during this place two hours on a Sunday morning. But we find Jesus constantly worshiping God through the way that he lived, the way that he interacted with other people. I think we're being called to spend time in our neighbors' homes, in the hospitals, the grocery stores, in our community, Worshiping God through the the way that we meet people, welcome people, and take care of their needs. You see, not only did Jesus get around, but everywhere he went, he did good. He healed people. He taught them. He feeds the hungry. He gives mercy to people in distress. Mercy is all about meeting someone's needs right now, not about attacking the problems at a systematic level. I mean, it's easy for me to look out at all of the massive issues in our community and to get discouraged and think, you know, I'm just one person. All I can do is small and insignificant things. Yet Jesus doesn't seem to have a problem with that. If a single person is hurting or hungry, he helped them right then and there. I know that the systematic problems in our society demand solutions, but it's going to take us a long time to correct a culture. And before we get it corrected, a lot of people are going to be hurting. Guys, a Band-Aid won't help a bullet wound, but if all we have is a Band-Aid, shame on us for not using it. If we want to be the kind of church that looks like Jesus, we have to go around doing good works, doing good things, even if the good we can accomplish is very small. Secondly, we see that Jesus' ministry was aimed at body and soul. Jesus says in Mark 138, that the whole reason he came to the world was to preach. His objective was to preach, not to feed the hungry, not to heal the sick, not to cast out demons or to do miracles. He came to preach. Yet in the very next verse, immediately following that proclamation that he only came to preach, we read that he travels throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus is incredibly balanced. He heals the sick, he liberates the demon-possessed, he confronts the complacent, he teaches the confused. His ministry wasn't just aimed at hungry stomachs or sick bodies. Jesus came to save souls. And apparently, a part of that mission also became helping people in a more immediate and physical way. If we want to be worthy of the name of Christ, I think we'll continue to expand our care for the needs of the whole person. Finally, I think Jesus believed that to change a community, you really have to change the church. That's why he calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John. On any Sabbath day, you would probably find those men in the synagogue, but it really wasn't worship for them. It was just an obligation. 
And Jesus turns it into an obsession. Jesus calls Levi. He didn't even go to church anymore. The church had kicked him out. But Jesus wanted him to use his gifts to build God's eternal kingdom instead of his own temporary castle. Jesus believed that the way to change a community is to change the church. That's why he confronted the religious leaders. Jesus saw that they had made tradition their idol, comfort their God. They searched the scripture for confirmation, not revelation. And he knew that if God was going to bring good news to the people, the church needed to get back on its knees in prayer, back into the Bible. It had to get out into the community. I believe that if we really want to be a church that looks like Christ, we must be concerned with the things that Christ was concerned with. We need to be a church, a group of people that are invested in prayer, committed to the book, and want to get out of this building where we can truly connect with our community. We need to meet our neighbors. And on a personal level, we need to pray with them and for them. We need to do more than just talk about loving our neighbors. We need to actually put blood and sweat into the act of loving them. Now, I know we've gone a little long today, so what I need to do is we just need to to stop and let me remind you that the whole reason we gather at the table is because God is interested in fixing what we've broken. The table's not a place of comfort. It's a place to think and to reflect on what God has offered us. It's also a, a place to rejoice and to be thankful that God loved us so deeply that He offered us the Savior we needed. So as we go to the tables, we go as a commitment to be changed, to be more like Jesus. And today I want us to focus on this calling to follow God and to share the good news of salvation with one another and with our community. It is vitally important that you gather with your Christian brothers and sisters. It is, it's needful for your soul to be with people that are experiencing the same struggles and same issues that you're struggling with. We gather at the table to encourage and to support one another, but more importantly, we gather at the table to send one another out into this community to be the light that we have been called to be in a dark place. And so this morning, instead of questions, we're going to spend some time at the table just thinking about what are some practical things we can do to be like Jesus, to go out into our community and to share the good news of salvation, not condemnation, not guilt, not uh, shame, but to go into our community to meet our neighbors, to meet the people in the grocery stores, in the coffee shops, to meet the people that, that God places in our path every day, to share with them the story of redemption, forgiveness, and acceptance. That's what Jesus offers us. That's what we get to experience at the table. And, and my prayer is this time at the table this morning will give us the courage and the strength and the opportunity to go into the world and to be like Jesus. I hope you have a wonderful time around the table this morning. I hope that you never forget how deeply you're loved. Please go in peace. I look forward to seeing you very soon.